Like the, the excitement that's created around these product launches removes the necessity for us having to rely on discounts to push our product. And it actually removes the necessity for us to even explain why people should buy our product from our, from our funnel. Like the funnel is just very focused on we're launching product, get on board, sign up for the emails. You don't want to miss this. Hello and welcome to Pilot House Hot Seat, the show where we grill amazing entrepreneurs about the secrets of their success and try to help them improve their digital marketing. Today, we are lucky to have John Hagen. John is someone I've known for a few years uh, throughout my travels in this wonderful performance marketing world. He is the director of growth at Pure Lay, a three-year-old, eight-figure, direct-to-consumer women's jewelry and accessories e-commerce company located in Germany. He's calling us from Colorado. Uh, and so from 2018 to 2019, John helped scale Pure Lay 3X in a super competitive vertical from high seven figures to a healthy eight figure total with his advanced performance marketing mindset. Uh, before that, he came up in Josh Elizeche's uh, Snow Teeth Whitening Company. So, uh, you know, a, a, a friend of a, a friend of a friend in that regard. Uh, and so he definitely cut his teeth on uh, some amazing products, some amazing work. Welcome to the hot seat, John. How you doing? Yeah, doing well, man. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's uh, it's always great to connect during these times. It's just like any any time you, you know you, you jump on the phone with people during this time. Everyone is just so interested in uh, in connecting and sharing, just because we're so starved for connection in, in other ways, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think uh, as I told you just a minute ago, my my fiance is in nursing, and every time that she, uh, especially during the quarantine, every time that she comes home, it's like this. Like, like I just have to talk to somebody because I haven't spoken all day to some, like to a real person in person, you know? So it's definitely, everybody's craving more connection now. Uh, everybody's looking for that, you know, looking for the, the fix to getting out of their apartment if they, if they can. So yeah, it's totally. great. And you're in Colorado, which has a lot of great outdoor options. Yeah, thankfully, thankfully. I just moved here from, uh, I just moved here in February from Kansas City. Um, actually, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy that, that I made that move when I did because it's a, it's, it's much more quarantine friendly of a place, especially now that rules are starting to open back up and we're able to get outside as much as, as much as we can. Very cool. So you, you, you were buying for, uh, Josh, you're buying in the, in the snow organization there. You're the lead buyer, media buyer for that team. Um, what brought you over? How did you get connected with a German company? Like, tell us that story a little bit. So I was actually buying for Josh through an agency, actually probably for a mutual friend that, that you know as well, probably Nick Shackelford. Uh -huh. So I, uh, I, I was part of the original structured social squad. Uh, so when I was in college, I was just a broke college kid trying to figure out, I kind of had this idea that like I was supposed to bust my ass through college and, you know, abide by the rules. And I actually heard that a, a friend of mine had a, a friend from high school had made the fidget spinner go viral. Like that was his thing. And when I heard that, my eyes just got big and I was like, I, I just reached out to him as soon as I heard that. Teach me everything that you know. And that's Jake Schmidt. And so, so he, I, I reached out to him, worked, we worked together for a while. And then this agency that we started to put together grew too fast to be in uh, little old St. Louis, Missouri. So we moved it out to Los Angeles um, where we started buying for Josh uh, through Snow and through a couple other, with, with, we had about 10 clients. Um, and then through that agency, we started doing some consulting. Um, the consulting that we were doing was just for other various e-commerce companies, and one of them ended up being Pure Lay. Uh, actually, at the time, they were trying to get into the United States as a company and start growing the business here. Uh, so, so the co-founder, um, Etienne Espiner, came to Los Angeles to look at a 3PL. And we met, and we hit it off, and we rode Harleys in Malibu. And long story short, I got, I, we, uh, yeah, started developing a long-term relationship and I came to work for Pure Life. Sounds like a bromance. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Constantly happens in this industry that there's, there's no doubt about that. Well, it's just exciting. You know, I, I think that there's so many different kind of echo chambers or thought leaders or it's, it, you know, and then you kind of find one that you really agree with and that really resonates with the way that you've been thinking about things. And yeah, it's, it, it, it's really easy to hit it off with those kind of people. And that's been definitely one of them. So talk about Pure Lay as a company. Uh, you know, jewelry is something uh, I, I was involved with earlier in my career. I, I had a jewelry brand that I was, that I was helping scale, but I've been out of it for a while. And, and you, you do see a lot of jewelry brands out there. They're sort of like a staple product for people in e-commerce because of the shipping, low shipping costs and, and high relative value. Uh, t tell us what, what sort of really drew you to Pure Lay as an opportunity. Man, yeah, good points. Jewelry is, 
is a very difficult niche to exist in. Um, I think that what, what kind of drew me originally, to be honest with you, it was a, a relatively kind of short-lived analysis of the company before I jumped in. Um, the company culture caught me immediately and people say that, but like, I really, really like, it's a very fun vibe. It's a very fun company to work with. You can tell that everybody's very, uh, high achieving and aggressive, you know, and, and all those kind of things. That was one large uh, consideration of mine. And then the second was, um, we, I think that bar none, we have some of the best content in the game, uh, as long as, as, as well as influencer work and those two things put together that's what sells jewelry. You know, I mean, every jewelry is such a competitive product because I mean, how many companies in the U S are e-commerce companies that sell jewelry? Thousands, right? So yeah. in order to stand out influencer marketing, they were doing the things that I thought were the right things to do to sell jewelry. And it turned out that once, once we were able to kind of put solid paid social practices into play, um, it was just gasoline on top of the fire. So. Very cool. And so talk a little bit about what those, what those tactics were like, what did you sort of recognize that had to be done right away? Obviously UGC, was it just, was it about breaking out top, middle, bottom of funnel or what was your thinking process going into it? Um, so we sat there, let's say, let's see, 2018 around like August. I was, I was in Germany. I go there quite a bit to, to work with the team in person. And, and I was there and uh, we, we were sitting kind of in a brainstorming session and we were just like, you know why we're, we're doing great what are we missing and what would make us really take off we've got we, we've always got really aggressive goals you know revenue goals what, what would make us take off and, and so there was kind of this kind of like at the time we only had um yeah we probably only had 30 to 40 SKUs. so we decided to open up our product uh line that we have and, and just really do execute a lot of product launches um and then the second was we were looking at our looking at influencers and we were like, we know that this is the heart of our brand. How can we maximize these influencer relationships? So um, we opened up the product line and we, and we launched products actually from 2018, 2019, we had 43 product launches. So almost every single week we launched products. It's very, it was a very fast fashion approach, uh, which has some really cool elements and has some not so cool elements that we're learning right now. But um, that's, that's been one key element of it. Um, and stop me along the way if you have questions, by the way, I know I'm, I'm rambling. No, no, this is great. And, and I, this is, this brings me to like, uh, product launch. So I wanted to actually talk about products and, and the novel aspect of, uh, of the jewelry brand or the jewelry that you're actually working with. Are these actual like designs from, mm -hmm. you know, German jewelry makers that, that are like on the cutting edge of what's cool. Are these products that are, are selling well elsewhere that are then replicated? Like what's the actual product model? I'm curious for, for jewelers. So we have a full product launch team. Um, so the product launch team has, has uh, let's see, we have, I believe we have five to six full-time employees with a, with a leader that, that are in charge of product, of, of specifically product design. So the product goes from ideation to, to actually, you know, creating mock images and, 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 and design and then actually get sent over to our, to our uh, manufacturer in China where it is. So it's very, in trend, uh, highly calculated product design that I do not touch with a 10 foot pole because I know nothing about jewelry product design, but it's, it's very well thought out and the girls that, that are in charge of it do a very good job. Are you guys, just kind of a weird question, are you, are, you, are you testing like designs through ads first by chance to gauge like interest? That'd be, I mean, like it's a common drop shipper model, right? Where you just, you test it first before you, you invest. So we don't do that, but we do test, we do design collections specifically with influencers. So mm -hmm. we hand in hand with an influencer launch a line of collections and that's kind of as much pro as much crowdsourcing as we get for like, how, how is this product, how is this product launch going to go over? Are people going to like this? Those kind of things. So we don't actually like launch pre-launch anything before we've got it in manufacturing. Right. Um, we, we have it full on, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it's done a lot of times hand in hand with someone who's, obviously knows the jewelry game and is very, yeah. Sure. One of the things uh, that you mentioned in the notes earlier was just this preference of focusing on product launches versus discounts. And I know a lot of people have uh, a dependent relationship on discounts where you, once you start down that path, uh, it's difficult to kind of pull yourself out of it. Can you talk a little bit about that journey? And then ultimately I want you to get into like a bit of a thumbnail sketch of what one of your product launches looks like. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Um, 
So that was kind of the other thing that we were looking at a couple of years ago. At the same time that we decided we needed to launch a bunch of products, we wanted to figure out how can we maximize these launches? How can we leverage influencers effectively? Um, and, and also, how, what about events, right? So um, we, we, we launched, like, like I said, we launched about 40, product, 40 42 uh, product launches during that time. So we came to a very, and at the beginning, it was extremely sloppy, right? It was like, do we need a landing page for these launches? It, it just, there was no, there was no, nobody had laid the foundation. We had nobody that had any experience with product launches. Uh, but by the end, it sort of turned into this extremely calculated, uh, like laser focused. Everybody knew what they wanted to do, they needed to do from, um, and so it looked kind of like this. We would launch, we would, we would, as I said already, we would pair that launch with an influencer. Um, and about five days before we launch products, we, we start teasering. So we have a teasering phase where we have a specific landing page that has, that's, that's collecting email signups. Um, and, and so we're, we're teasering on social email, our organic influencers, organic, uh, paper posts, uh, basically any, anywhere that we have data collected, anywhere that we have followers, we're telling them, Hey, we're launching something coming up here pretty soon. Um, so from day one to up to launch date, we're putting significant portions of the budget. We spend about a third of our Facebook budget actually before the product, before any of the products even launch. And it actually significantly, well, we're also, so let me back up. We're also doing dark posts throughout this whole. So we're teasering with dark posts, using influencers to marry, uh, to marry organic and, and paid social together. So we're, so we're also leveraging that. And uh, it's just sort of building up. It's like a volcano approach, right? So you're just teasering and you're spending actually more time is probably spent considering the teaser than is even considered the actual launch. Because we're getting all of these pre-confirmed pre sales through email. And then when we launch, we really save a lot of our spend on the launch because we've got all of this data already collected and it's no longer trying to convince people you should, you should buy this product because of X, Y, and Z. It's just notifying we launched. And then the results are just, the results have continued to amaze. We're always just sitting there. We launch at the same time on the same day, Sunday, Sundays at 10 a.m. Everybody that follows us knows that that's when we're launching. And so it's just kind of like this conditioning around the, around the followers and around the people that follow our brand that like shit happens every week, like pay attention, you know, pay attention, sign up and like good stuff will happen. So it's, yeah. So go ahead on that. Like, are you, are you taking pre-orders or is it more just like, Hey guys, build it up for the launch mm -hmm. and they just love the brand so much that they want to participate and they love it. Yes, exactly. So we, we don't do pre-orders. It's just a teaser sign-up form on, on, on a landing page. It's, very, it's a very simple landing page, honestly. It's, it's done with Shogun. Like, there's, there's nothing super crazy or special about it. And they don't even, sometimes we'll flash in the product to generate excitement, but sometimes we're not even showing them what the product's going to be. They're just, they just know that, like, yeah, we, have, we actually have a repeat purchasing rate of about, I want to say our repeat customer rate sits around 60%. Wow. Wow. And that's part of that rolling thunder, right? That's part of that action happening every week and, uh, and people, you know, gaining momentum over time and wanting to be a part of these launches as well. That's such a cool, uh, cool plan. Exactly. It's LTV. It's repeat customer rate. It's, it, and then, but then it also, so these launches are about 60% to cold traffic. I'm in charge of paid social. So that's obviously my discipline, yeah. but they're, they're about 60% to, to, to cold traffic and 40% to retargeting. So we have a solid ratio of new customers to returning customers. So it's continuing to grow. Um, it's continuing to yeah, generate excitement. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's been product launch. So that additionally, it's completely removed the necessity for having these uh, detrimental short-term volume growth discounts as a part of our funnel. We don't have our Facebook approach as zero discounts. Our emails at the most have 10%. Like the, the excitement that's created around these product launches removes the necessity for us having to rely on discounts to push our product. And it actually removes the necessity for us to even explain why people should buy our product from our, from our funnel. Like the funnel is just very focused on we're launching product, get on board, sign up for the emails. You don't want to miss this. John, John, I love that. One area that you mentioned where you're tying influencers into each of these launches, I know a lot of brands we work with and brands in the space uh, are moving towards that sort of higher, you know, faster pace, higher quantity influencer relationships. How are you mm -hmm. defining who the right influencer is? You know, can you, can you take us through that profiling? 
Yeah, it's a good question. Um, obviously, and, and, and I know we talked about a little bit, like there, one of the things that is tricky to navigate when talking about a European brand is the ceiling that you run into, right? So we, we have this kind of conception as a Canadian brand or as an American brand, we don't ever think about a ceiling, right? So that ceiling kind of hits in all aspects at, at, at given times, you know, where you have to get into uh, different, different demographics, different influencers, you have to expand within your, your market because it's a lot easier to expand within your market than it is to hop into another market and create a whole new website. And all. So that's kind of the way that we've been able to um, circumvent the problem of like, we, we, we do um, like we do around 60 influencer collaborations every weekend. So, you know, like after a while of dipping into the same pond and having these product launches, sometimes I think it can sound very repetitive. Um, so we've kind of, the, the way that we've gotten around that is by looking at our kind of customer avatar and not just relying on one customer avatar, but saying like, okay, what's our number two? You know, what's our number three? Okay. And, and what influencers are they looking at? And then, and then you're able to kind of expand into different influencers accordingly. You mentioned, um, that's super cool. You mentioned kind of, cause how many markets are you? And I looked at your ads library. Is it like six or so? Yeah, we're in, we're in three heavily. We're yeah. in. Well, we're in Austria. We're in Swit uh, We're in Austria. We'd like to be in Switzerland, but their shipping is their shipping regulations are ridiculous. Uh, and and we're in. We're, we just France is a new venture for us, and then the U.S. is kind of a back burner for because that's a that's a really hard one, right? Because when you talk about uh, Germans, the U.S. Americans just have no conception that other countries are like when they when an American sees when a French person sees German in an Instagram story, they say, "Oh, that's German. That's probably just a German company." Yeah. But when an American sees German in an Instagram story, they say, is this like Russian or what? You know, we're so ignorant. And we're it's being invaded. Fault. We're being invaded, they say. <laughs> you, get, you get into, I mean, you can say that you're American. Like, we can't say that. But <laughs> we know. Um, but well, I know too. And we know too. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But um, like, can you talk a little bit about your stores and how you're breaking those up? You know, currency. Um, also, I noticed like your ads, you're, you're running localized ads, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of people, they'll run English everywhere, just go for the global, the global hit. And that works for some people. Do you have metrics on like those, the, the language and, and Latin? So the metric that we kind of use as our North star here is that 70% of customers won't check out if the, if the language is, if the, if the store's language at the checkout is not in their native tongue. Yeah. So yeah. we try our best to localize as much as possible. And this is really hard. This really creates complexities that I never imagined that I would be dealing with. You know, like it, when I got into this, it was it was it was just like mind boggling how many complexities there is. Because you know, like when you're let's one of the one of the biggest difficulties is something like Instagram, right? Because if we're posting on Instagram, right. we can't post in German because then we're only talking to our German customers. So we po we 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 have channels where we keep in English, like Instagram, but then websites are are different Shopify stores entirely. And they're in localized languages. The reason that Austria and Switzerland are quite a bit easier is because they speak German. So, yeah. but, but we try to localize as much as possible. Sadly, Facebook doesn't make it the easiest ta uh, task to do. But yeah, we, we localize stores. We localize ad copy. Um, we, we, we localize influencers, th those kind of things. And, and when inf you know, with, with it in mind that influencers really are the nucleus of how we sell our product, yeah. um, that makes it a smidge easier because we're not having to do these big drawn out product explanations in, in a language that we're not familiar with. I love that you've taken this idea of dark posts, influencers, localization, and, and just, I mean, it's a German company to begin with, so it absolutely makes sense. But I think a lot of people in our space like forget these other markets, right? Yeah. Well, and the CPMs are cheaper and there's a lot of market share to be had there. And there's not a lot of people that are from those areas in comparison to North America. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, you, you look at like, yeah, okay, Germany is a little bit smaller, but there's 84 million people there. Yeah. You know, so, so there's 84 million customers. And also, uh, they, have, they have a higher income per population. Mm -hmm. uh, th so there's a ton of consumer, you know, consumer behavior to be had there. Um, and also, I would say, and I would guess that Germans would say this as well, they're about two years behind where we are in the States. Yeah. So when I was when I came from agency in Los Angeles, where it's kind of like the epicenter of digital marketing, to Mannheim, Germany, I was able to really make it felt like I was really able to implement change and, and drive growth and revenue and, and all these things because we were doing things here. That dark post is a great example. 
where they didn't know what the con, you know, they hadn't heard the concept yet. And so I think it's mind boggling to me that more American companies and more Canadian companies don't consider, especially Germany, it's a huge country as, as a, as a potential market. Totally. I mean, on our side too, like on the agency side, we've really been able to grow accounts by going global and, you know, we're not going as deep as you are. Um, expertise times speed, uh, technical complications with stores and whatnot, but like we're doubling, tripling just by adding a few more countries. And, and it, it's important people think about that, I think. Right. Well, and I mean, you know, like I said, like that, that 70% figure, like, while that's true, I think it's kind of an older statistic. And like, if you look at Germany, 80% of Germans speak, speak quite good English. So, I mean, you can really hop over there pretty, pretty quickly. And then, and then you can, you know, test, prove the concept. And then if there is something there, then let's localize, you know, like, it, but if you're not trying it, you're missing out on 80 million customers who make more money on average than an American does. Yeah, that's, uh, that's amazing. I remember when I first, when we first jumped into, into Germany and, and tried to sell event tickets there, uh, for some reason, all of my U.S. television references, like my little jokes that I would do in the intro or whatever, they just didn't land in the same way. I had a German partner and he's like, they won't have any idea what you're talking about. I, I learned how, well, it's made me realize how ridiculous the English language is, but it's also made me realize how many like references that we use to sports that they don't follow at all. Like, I, I, don't, I didn't realize how many baseball, li li like, lingo, how much baseball lingo, like, oh, that's a curveball. Or, like, you know, like, just random crap like that where they're just like, what is a curveball? Chuck a fastball, hit a home run. <laughs> yeah. Right. Touchdown, yeah. totally. Home runs, like, what? Yeah, yeah. Th there's been some fun moments like that for sure. That's super funny. I wanted to back up a little bit on the product. I have a couple questions. One, I want you to go over dark posts a little bit for people that might be listening and not quite understanding what you mean there. I also just wanted a quick question about the product launches and whether you leverage scarcity. When you have these big, I remember I was talking with, um, uh, I forget, uh, uh, Greta, Greta Van Riel, uh, mm -hmm. and she was you know, launching her watch company. They had this whole um, time where they dropped stuff specifically, they had a very specific amount of product, and when it was done, it was done, and that ended up driving a lot of the, you know, that scarcity drove a lot of it as well. So I was wondering first if that was part of your strategy. So uh, do you want dark post or scarcity? That one first. Scarcity. Um, we do leverage scarcity. So we have... You know, we have so many launches that I would say about, I would say about 15% of the time we leverage, we use scarcity. Like we really, um, we, we, we really use, a, 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 you know, that is a, a main element of our marketing approach. So like one, one example, uh, advent calendars, which is something we don't do in the U.S. I've never, I've, I have not really heard of brands launching advent calendars. It's a huge thing in Germany. Um, this was our most successful by far, bar none, uh, product launch of 2019. And we had only a limited amount. And I mean, this was, this was also a pre-sale. So I lied, we do, we do occasionally do that, but this was also pre-sale and we only had a certain number. And we learned after about, I believe we sold out in four hours and it was a, the most amazing product. Like it was, it was insane, but it was because we only had a certain number and there was a lot of jewelry and it was a great deal. And, and we pushed that like whole idea that once this is sold out, like, I mean, we literally, it, it will be Christmas by the time that you have another opportunity to, to purchase, right? So it's an advent calendar. So scarcity with jewelry. Um, one thing that we've learned about female consumers in general, if there's, if scarcity is a part of the deal, it's always, it's always a hook. They love to be kind of surprised, like not completely surprised to where they have no idea what they're getting, but like they love to know, like, I'm going to get a silver watch and that's it. And, and here's and here's like, so a surprise box, right? Our surprise box is a huge play for us. Mystery, we have a mystery product upsell. We're gonna, we actually haven't implemented it yet, but we're gonna implement a mystery product upsell at checkout. So more than scarcity, we leverage like a question mark, right? We leverage like mystery of like, you're gonna get something that you're gonna like. It's gonna be, it's, it's a decent set. It's, a, it's a, at a decent price, but uh, there's only gonna be so many of them but you don't know what it is yet, right? Like they, they, it, for some reason, that just really triggers a lot of consumer demand. It's really interesting. That's a great tip, I think, too. We had, a, we had that recently with a client that ran into inventory issues and we ran a, a promotion that capitalized on that to say, it's a surprise box. It'll be in your size, but we don't know what color it's going to be. And it, it did extremely well. Dead stock. Yeah. You can do a surprise box and they don't care. And, and that's a cool thing. It's a win-win because if you're a consumer and you, you know, and you, if you're a guy and you spend... I don't know, you're, you're interested in fishing lures, right? And you spend 20 bucks and you get 10 fishing lures. You don't care at all if they're what the company couldn't sell. You don't care. You're just like, oh my gosh, I paid 20 bucks and I got 
10, you know, 10 awesome products. I mean, it's, it's such an awesome, it's such an awesome mover of dead stock. And that's what we use it for a lot. Sorry. My daughter is, is knocking at the door in the middle of a podcast. Sweetie, you got, got to come in and say hello to the guys or you got to be quiet. <laughs> Cheers. Okay. I think I, I, think that right, in. I think I've almost torn my fiance's head off about 10 times since the quarantine started. This is one of the, one of the difficulties we deal with. Oh, wait till you have children. I was oh. this morning, my wife had to go into work and I had to, to teach on top of, of, of all this. And it's, uh, I'm definitely ready for the for school to be back. I don't I don't know if it's happening. So yeah, sock, sock on the door has a whole new meaning. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. um, but anyway, we might be able to edit that out. We may not. Who knows? Uh, roll. But uh, yeah, talk to us about dark posts. This is something that 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 you know advertisers have been using for a long time. But in the context of of influencers and and your launch strategy, can you talk about that a bit? So let me back up to yeah. So my my introduction to dark posts. Um, you, you, guys, you guys had Josh on here a while ago. I listened to that one. And he, he is one of those guys that when you talk to him, you're just like, oh, my God, there's another level. Like, there's just a total another, you know, you're, you're just, you just listen to him, and, and, and he's, just, he's just so at the forefront of digital. So when I was working for, uh, when I was working for the agency and we were running ads for Snow, um, we, he, he introduced the idea of this, this dark post. And we are actually running them with Floyd Mayweather and Rob Gronkowski. Um, and so like my introduction was like crash course to the fullest extent with the biggest influencers ever. And we used to, I used to just marvel at the, the idea of this. And it's so beautiful because like it, it takes the negatives of influencer marketing and the positives of paid social and it just marries them together and sends it to the extreme. So I guess, do you want me to explain what a dark post is? I'm hoping that a lot of listeners, most people, most people will, but just uh, 10 yeah. seconds. So a, a dark post is essentially using an influencer's uh, business account to, to provide access to your paid social side so that you're running ads through the influencer's name. I'm sure that everybody has at least seen them by now. Um, and and it's, it's amazing to me how, how long it's taken for the marketing communities to sort of adapt to that approach. Um, but it's, it's, it's beautiful because you control the frequency of, of how many times people are seeing your ad, right? Because if you pay for a post and you're paying, I mean, let's talk about like Floyd May Mayweather you're paying probably a ton of money, right, for that post. Well, what, I mean, only, especially with how organic Instagram works nowadays, only a very small percentage of his following is going to ever be able to see that ad. Um, so you're able to control the frequency and say, we're, we're not going to, you know, we're going to put a cap on it. We're not going to, you know, it's coming from that influencer. It's as strong of a message. Um, and, and you really, you get to leverage it for cold traffic, warm traffic, the whole funnel. It's, we, we see that about 30% of results from 30 uh, dark posts improve paid social results by about 30 percent on average for our funnel so when we were launching these when we were launching these product lines and these collections with influencers that was the question right was how do we leverage these uh these influencer collections because they're expensive they're, there's a lot you kind of launch the collection with a gun pointed at your head right because you've paid a lot of money for that collection you paid a lot of money for the influencer to be a part of it um, we always have events around the collection launches that are live streamed on our Instagram. So, so they're, they're just, there's a lot of overhead on these. How else, what else can we do? And the, the natural line of reasoning was let's, let's do dark posts alongside. So um, from the, with that influencer with extremely large budgets launching, we're, we're sending to their followers, to cold traffic, to anybody that's interested in our product that we're launch, launching alongside with, with all the other stuff that's going on. So it's, it's really powerful. Hey, hey, John, we've seen, we've seen mixed results with using dark posts to cold audiences. Mm -hmm. like naturally, they work really well to warm audiences, you know, all website visitors or the influencers audiences themselves. Do you have any tips that you could share in terms of what, you know, technically you've done to, to make prospecting really prosper? That's, that's a great point. It's definitely prospecting is kind of the, like it sort of hinges on if prospecting can work, right? Because I mean, a lot of times you're paying a decent amount of money for these and warm traffic is a given, but you can, I mean, if you have a hundred thousand followers, there's only so much of your product that you can sell to a hundred thousand followers. Um, so I, what, one thing that I always do from just an interesting targeting perspective is I look through the Instagram. A lot of times I have, well, all of the time, I have no idea who these influencers are. They're German women influencers that, that I just don't know. Um, so I'm from an interest targeting perspective, I'm always looking through their Instagram account and seeing what, what kind of influencer we're talking about here, right? Are they always at the beach? 
Are they, are they a mom influencer? Are they a blogger? What are they writing about? Is it cooking? You know, to make sure that that interest targeting is actually relevant to what that influencer's audience is used to. And, and, you know, I think that increases the likelihood that maybe they've seen them somewhere. Maybe they've, maybe they've interacted with the post before and just not followed them. Um, you know, there's a better chance that they're more likely to have, have had a run in with that influencer. Additionally, um, I'm sure you guys might be doing this already, but I'm always creating lookalikes based off of their engagers. That's kind of a, you know, like that, that's also increasing the likelihood that at least the person, the type of person who is going to see the ad is more likely to be susceptible to, to the message that I'm conveying to them, the resonation of, you know, that it's going to resonate with them and that they're going to in turn, you know, it's going to, it's going to have a larger impact on them. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. What about, what about the creative side? Do you guys guide that? Do you, do you give them a prescription in terms of what you want? So at this point, since we've done so many of these, we have a team that that's, that's really, we have a team that's specifically geared towards dark posts, just generating and getting content and those kind of things. So we have obviously one of the most difficult things about these collaborations is that there's a lot of parties involved, right? So you're going from brand to agency to influencer, back to, back to, or back to agency, back to brand. And then it's just this communication channel that's ridiculously long. So streamlining that is really important. But also what I do is I always have three 15 second videos in story format so that instead of this being a 15 second video that someone's seeing and then just, you know, a lot of times people immediately when they know it's an advertisement, they just skip right past it. They can't do that, right? It gives me two more taps and that two more taps can be enough time for them to be like, oh wait, this is an ad, but I know this influencer or I've seen this person before or I've seen this product before. So just harnessing that, it sounds small, but that you know, amount of navigation through their stories and, and where they're sitting and where they're paying attention with an influencer who's promoting your product can really make all the difference. Additionally, there are, you know, a lot of the headache with this comes from th that communication and the time that it takes to go from ideation of concept to finally signing the deal to having the influencer actually be able to give you rights and access. Um, and, and just that process can really take a long time. And the more content that we can get and the more dark posts that we can get, the more that we can split test and that sort of stuff. So there's a tool that we use called Caro, C-A-R-R-O. And they're, they're using, they're, they're introducing this uh, white, late, white tech, they call it, everybody's using a different name for dark posts, but they're, they're doing a, running a beta version right now that literally takes that whole process and streamlines it and you just request access and then the influencer gets an email and she gives access and then she submits content the same way. So those, those are huge elements that have really streamlined the headache that this can typically cause. Very cool, good tips, man. Nice. I wanted to just jump a little bit. I was reading up on your LinkedIn and I saw, I know everyone has nice things on their, uh, on their recommendations, mm -hmm. but you were specifically, they specifically were going, uh, this person was going into your sort of management ability and, and sort of your inherent ability to teach, which is something I'm always interested in as someone who's made courses and you know, looking to make some more in the future. Can you talk a little bit, first of all, how big is your team and talk a little bit about, about your management style. It sounds like you must have a fairly large team to, to manage influencer launches at this scale. So we have a, we have a sales team um, and our sales team is about eight or nine, 10, somewhere in, in that ballpark. But then the influencer team in itself is 10. And, and, and then, and then my team is three. So, so orchestrating, orchestrating all of this does take, does take a lot of, you know, a lot of effort there. We have, we actually follow a, um, we follow a, a, a program called scale up. It's a, it's by, it's, it's about, it's based off of a book by Vern Harsh, Vern Harnish, something, something along those lines. And, and, and it's a, it's, it's a really effective uh, process for, you know, a lot of times all of the, all of the startups that I've been a part of, it can just feel like this giant maze and communication is a big question mark. And who do I ask these questions to? And when do we actually sync on things? And it's been, that program has really helped us to implement daily huddles, weekly meetings, and, and, and sort of set the framework for, for management and, and, and this sort of, um, yeah, this, this, and, and take the question mark out of like, who does this question go to? Where do I, and, and that can really make, it, make a huge difference. Um, and then it just comes with practice. You know I mean? As far as like, as far as the, the, the process that we have of product launches and of like, that's a big piece of our business that it really was a mess when we first started doing it. We had no idea who was in charge of, you know, that, that was a really blurred line. We had no product launch manager. Um, but then after we tried it once and we found success, we like 
double down is an under exaggeration. We like quadruple down on it. And we just said, we're going to perfect this process and put the necessary pieces in place so that instead of everybody saying, Oh, what time is this launching and having to go, we have a, we have a launch manager who's in charge of creating a deal sheet and in charge of creating an air table. And, and so it's just, it's come with practice and fine tuning. It's so, it's so nice that moment where you realize like startups very much. It's, it's like, People are in the trenches swinging picks, trying to find gold, right? Mm -hmm. Especially in the media buying game. And when you like, as a manager or as an owner, and you find that, that like, oh, we have someone to build a process around now. Mm -hmm. And then like, let's expand on that. Like, that's such a cool, a cool feeling when you're able to go from that chaos, everyone in on everything to, hey guys, you know your roles. Let's communicate. Let's talk about the problems. Let's, let's figure out how to solve them in a structured way. It's such a cool feeling. 100%. And it's, it's, uh, it's really one of those things that I think you have to take a step back all the time. And like, let's just look at where we were last month. Startups move at such a quick pace that you can some, you, it's so easy to get bogged down in that like, we have so far to go. We have so much improvement. We're so not where we want to be right now. But then if you can just every month kind of take a, we have like a monthly coaching call, which is really cool. And if you can kind of take that monthly coaching call and just be like, I know that it seems like we have a lot to do. We have a lot to do. But look at where we were last month when we had this call, you know, like it, that, that call in itself has helped me to not only from being managed, but also to, to manage, you know, it's just been helping. so helpful to see like the progress and actualize the progress that we've come to on a, on a month to month basis. Is that coaching call? That sounds super cool. Is that, is that an external coach? Is that your CEO or is that you coaching other people? What does that look like? Me being coached by my manager and me coaching the people that I'm managing. So it's, it's, it's a, it's an internal thing. We also have external uh, consultants who help, who have helped implement that coaching call. And mm -hmm. those are, we have workshops with those kind of people, but this is like 30 minutes, no bullshit where how have i done over the last month and what do i need to do next month to be more successful cool yeah that's awesome and is your team fully remote as well or is it mainly you well obviously we're all remote now um but what does it break down like during uh, non-apocalyptic times yeah um i'm one of man so we have we have about 110 people in the company at this point and i'm one of like three that's really full on remote but like i said i do i do a lot to circumvent that I do a lot to circumvent the remoteness and I do a lot to circumvent the, the time gap. So I, we always joke that like, I don't have a time zone. So I, so I'll take meetings. I'll take meetings at 3 AM. I'll take meetings at 5 AM. Like I really try to work my best because I really appreciate the position that they put me in, you know, and I, I really try to work my best to circumvent that problem and not turn down meetings if they're th at that time. And, and, you know, especially if they're important, like we were able to get, um, for example, we were able to get a, uh, we actually had a meeting with the, the director of global media at Adidas two weeks ago. And he was in, uh, yeah, which was one of the most insane meetings I've been a part of. But he was, uh, he was in um, the UK at the time. And I gave him, I, I was just bugging him on LinkedIn, just trying to get a meeting put together because I knew that he knew something about attribution that we were trying to figure out. Um, and after like, I think I sent him like 12 LinkedIn messages. After 12 LinkedIn messages, I finally got a response and I had been giving him my calendar the whole time. Just, you know, whenever you have a, whenever you have a free 30 minutes, just schedule with me. And he scheduled it at 2.30 in the morning. And I was like, all right, I guess we're having, I guess we're having a meeting at 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> so yeah, I really try to circumvent that time difference as much as possible. And I'm over there a lot too. Very cool. Let's talk traffic a little bit. So Obviously, you're, uh, it sounds like your Facebook and Instagram's uh, like centric. But what does your traffic breakdown look like in terms of other traffic platforms? Have you had any surprising winners on TikTok or anything? We look at TikTok as a big question mark right now. We use it. We, we, we have sort of decided to until we've tested it from a paid social standpoint. Um, and I think that one of the things that TikTok is lacking right now that they need to figure out how to do is to make it less of like a, a native feeling ad or a native plat platform. So you have like Google, which is so intent driven, right? You go on Google to get off Google. And then you have Facebook, which has done an excellent job of marrying the two. And I think that's why as a social media platform, monetizing has been no problem for them. But then TikTok, like I love TikTok, but when I get on it, I'm never there to leave TikTok. I'm never on TikTok to shop, you know? So that, that has been really hard. For, I mean, we, we, we've, we've decided to double down on the organic side of TikTok and try to make content that's really has a lot of virality and that sort of thing. We've done some stuff with Snapchat. Um, not, not, a ton of, not a ton of success on Snapchat either. We, we really sit in those Instagram and Facebook sections. We have a lot of, we do a lot of email and then we do a lot of PR. 
So we're in glossy box. We're in all of those kind of subscription box that where we give a free product out. We're in a lot of PR, uh, just various PR companies. Like they have something called my uni days. That's for uh, college kids who have discounts. We have uh, uh, things with corporate benefits where they have companies and they give out, you know, they give out promotions for our brand. But as far as like our core traffic, it's Facebook and it's influencers and it's really influencers as much as anything. Very cool to hear that just the, the scale, like I, we've, we, we do a lot of influencer marketing as well. Um, but just to hear it as organized into, into how many influencer launches were you saying a week? Like influencer collaborations? Yeah. They're amazing. Our team, I can't, our team is just so insane. I think, we, I think we'll do about on a, on a, on a slow week, we'll do 40 and on a, on a busy week. I mean, over black, over black Friday, I think we're going to do something like Q4 November. I think we're going to do something like 600. Wow. That's incredible. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm thinking of the client we do this the most with, and we're stoked if we get like 10 done in a month. Mm. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, it's, to move faster. I think when we've done, when we, when we see the effects that happen with as, you know, involving them as much as possible, it's really just where we've put the North star at. And it's where it's, we try to remember that in everything that we do, but the, our team, all credit goes to the influencer team at Fuelite. They're, they're really amazing. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> so with these different traffic platforms, with all these different uh, influencers going, let's talk a little bit about your attribution model. This mm. is something as an agency, we're always, uh, you know, on a month end basis, there's always interesting discussions that come up around attribution. Uh, with you sitting on top of the marketing organization here, how do you think about attribution and, and have you built out anything that allows you to get uh, a clear picture of actually what's happening, what's contributing, what's leading to the conversions. So this is, a, I'll have to warn you, this is a slippery slope with me because I'll talk about attribution for another hour if you want to. Um, but so we had, we actually have and had and still have a pretty significant problem with our attribution. So when you consider sort of our model, we, we actually started noticing this with Snapchat. When you consider our model, we have such an organic, heavy, direct uh, search, like that's just so strong. That's such a strong part that's spewing throughout our business. Um, we started doing Snapchat ads about, I would say a year ago. And we tested the water with Snapchat ads and we saw like what we saw was amazing. We were immediately like just shocked and so excited because we saw this, this like six, seven X with barely any work. We were just testing the waters initially and we were like, wow, this is amazing. We need to, you know, we need to scale up here. But then after about a week of seeing those results, we were like, our Shopify revenue hasn't changed at all. So like, where's the money? <laughs> like, I mean, we see these great. So then we started this kind of slippery slope into the attribution models that platforms use. And um, this has started this really extensive journey uh, that has turned into us. So essentially we went into what, well, what kind of attribution, what's the window, right? So we're looking at a 28 day click one day view attribution model on Facebook. And we started UTM tagging everything. That was essentially where we started. Um, we, we have a, there's a, there's a resource that people can really look to called, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a guy named Avinash Kaushik. He's the data evangelist at Google. Um, and he will talk you through essentially how to implement a custom attribution model on, uh, in Google analytics. And we started doing this and what we started seeing was the money that we thought was coming from very, from certain social platforms and various, you know, TikTok, Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, it was convoluted. And so we started looking at what's the truth look like. So flash forward, we actually, from a direct response perspective, focus solely on a one day click attribution model on Facebook. Now we do this with the understanding that, and I'm trying to simplify this as much as possible, but we do that with the understanding that this is not a way to judge profitability. It's purely a, a way to optimize campaigns and to, to judge what did we do yesterday that brought results and what can we do today to maximize the impact of those results. But I mean, this is crazy. This was crazy for me when I first got into it because I mean, we're talking about three years that I've been doing this. And in one article that I read online, I just completely changed the way that I'm viewing what I'm doing. And it's been interesting. So along with doing that, we have a customer attribution model and we're looking at actually developing right now an econometric model, um, which is, that's gonna be a while before we actually figure out what that means and what that looks like for our business. But Essentially, I think that one of the hardest things for digital marketers is that they don't even really, until you really get into the game, and a lot of times it seems like it's even six, seven years, they don't consider 
attribute the, the flaws of attribution. And so like, while we haven't had this end all be all beautiful solution, we all have a mindset of things might not be exactly what you, you know, you, you think the revenue, those, those, those guru screenshots that you're seeing on, on you know, on a, on, in a Facebook group might not be as good as what they're looking like. They might have a lot of double attribution. They might have a lot of ghost purchasing going on. There's just significant issues in the way that we view the topic of attribution as, as an industry. Now, when you say econometric, is it, 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 you don't have to get into what you're building there, but what is the mindset for building an econometric system? Is it, is it that like a fractional system where you're counting, you know, assists and, and things like that? So, yes. So attribution models are great, but attribution models have the, they're myopic and they assume that all digital, all digital sales are being dri driven by digital efforts, which is not true, right? We have, especially, and I think that this is amplified when you're talking about a European country, because word of mouth and the effects of direct and all those things are gonna be a lot stronger because there's a, there's a lot stronger of a community there. Um, so an attribution model is, is good for some things. It also, it only will take click data into consideration. So you're looking at the fact that 90% of customers on Facebook don't click ads. Well, okay, what the hell does that mean for a click-based attribution model, right? How, how, where's, the, where's the truth in it? So attribution models also only look at a maximum of 15 variables. So what we're trying to get out of an econometric model is it's a, it's a significantly more expensive solution, um, but it's a significantly more all-encompassing solution. So it'll take into consideration, I believe, up to somewhere around the, the lines of like 200 variables. And it can take into th things such as the weather, such as political elections, such as, you know, like these, these insane things that we never even consider when we look into an ads manager. So we're trying to implement the, an, econometric, an econometric model that takes into consideration the most valid, uh, reasonable, um, impactful uh, variables and how that applies to our marketing mix. It's, it's, and to be honest, we're a long ways from it, but it's been a really interesting journey to try to figure out exactly that question. What does it look like for our business? That's so just, just on that, so basically like, you know, we obviously have been going through this for 10 years, but <laughs> on, for different reasons and whatnot. Um, so on your ad platforms, like what would be your recommendation for uh, buyers and maybe buyers, you know, who are managing multiple channels or buyers internally that are versing, essentially like competing for that attribution? What's, what's something that you would tell your team to do? Um, I think that the best thing that we've done so far is drop that attribution window down and, and limit the amount of possibility for error there. Because if you have, especially when you consider the way that we were launching stuff, you know, we were launching with a one day view and we were, we were launching products and we were essentially, our Facebook launch strategy was we want everybody in our funnel to see this ad. Well, guess what? When everybody in your funnel sees that ad, it doesn't matter what drove them to purchase. It matters that the attribution model is 28 day click one day view. Yeah. So if you can minimize that effect and drop it down to something that's closer to the truth and understand that absolute numbers are bullshit, right? Understand that when you're looking at attribution, when you're looking at absolute numbers, you're not going to find the truth there. You need to look at optimizations and revenue per session and things that are taking into consideration the whole picture as opposed to just like a myopic view of what's my channel. Look like. One more question on attribution, then we'll jump. How do you manage attribution cross uh, dark posts for influencers? Yeah, good question. Um, that's, a, that's a very good question. Uh, so are you asking like in terms of like how they're paid? Or Because a lot of times, so originally we've shifted away from like a percentage of anything model. With yeah. that. So we used to be doing a lot of like percentages. Like we would do a rev share with a, with a launch with an influencer, right? But then we realized that our attribution sucks. So we're paying them for stuff that they didn't, have any part in right so we've shifted towards either doing just a strictly a spend share because that's on us right if we're deciding to spend then they should be compensated for you know the amount of times that we're using their, their content and that sort of thing so either that or just a straight this is what we're willing to pay take it or leave it kind of deal that's a great question though yeah um always something that we're concerned with as an agency right where we're, you know we obviously want to work with clients and take on as many um, aspects of their marketing as possible, which gives us that clear picture uh, mm. into attribution. But as it stands now, when you have some, some companies doing email, you know, another company doing, you know, Facebook, maybe another doing YouTube, uh, it's, it's going to be, it, it's, it, it's on that client really to understand 
their, you know, their attribution at a fundamental level, or they're going to be paying performance incentives and, you know, on, on a lot. I couldn't agree more. And that's, I think the danger of using potentially an agency that's, that, that you, that's, that's the, that's the, that explains the value of getting in bed with an agency that you really trust because otherwise there's a million ways that an agency who really knows the game can fudge the numbers and make you pay a lot more money than what they're actually doing, you know, than what they're actually, the value they're actually providing. Very cool. Well, I think that kind of covers all the, uh, the amazing things that I wanted to chat about today. Did anyone else have any other questions or topics? I think, I think we will do another one in the future where we just go, just go hog wild on some attribution stuff or we'll go right down that funnel. But yeah. for now, I think that that kind of covers it. And anything else from the uh, peanut gallery? <laughs> no, that was a lot of fun for me. Thanks so much, John. Yeah, really appreciate. Hey, I was curious. What uh, speaking of attribution? So, what question did you ask? If you if you if you can share this uh, this top dog at Adidas? Yeah, um, the most <laughs> the most. Uh, if you want to feel really helpless with attribution, what I asked him was the first question that I asked him was who who's who in the industry is doing a good job? And guess what he said? No one. No one. Yeah. No one. <laughs> yeah. We sat in a Facebook conference. It was a private thing in uh, Vancouver, maybe three, four years ago. And their attribution guy was there too. And he was going off and he was an ex Google guy. It's useless. It's helpless. It's hopeless. It's never going to work. <laughs> well, and you can be like that if you want to, but you know, I mean, that was the biggest breakthrough that I had in, in the starting point of that was, was uh, I had a Facebook marketing science employee tell me, the, the Facebook ads manager is not intended to be an attribution model. It is only intended for optimization. And if you use it, if you use it as an attribution model, you're going to be living in a fairy tale. And that just blew my damn mind. I was like, what are you talking about? Like, it was just like the Wizard of Oz veil got removed, you know, and I was, but, you know, I think that, yeah, the important thing to under, is to understand we're all working on this. And, and also, if you're not searching into this, you're going to be in a dark place with your business because it's it's a super important topic i think you nailed it on the head just like having those partners that know it that you can work with those metrics like what is profit what isn't where does that affect your search campaigns your amazon campaigns your email campaigns and just being collaborative about it i think you can mis like it's it's going to be murky but mm -hmm. you, you can absolutely like with the right with the right effort um get to know each other's businesses and find a balance i think well and that was one of the big takeaways that we ended up having was like we do have a problem, but we're profitable. Yeah. Right. So like we do have a problem, but like we don't need to go and flip the script and do, do crazy shit because we are, we understand our profit margins at the end of the year are good. So like, let's understand that and let's be, let's, let's just relax. Right. Like, yeah. yeah. Cool. Nice. All right. Well now we have to end it with a new tradition. This John will be the first one where we need a good thumbnail where we're all looking at our cameras and making like a YouTube face. So, <laughs> YouTube, so on the count of three for five seconds, let's all look at our cameras. What's a YouTube face? That's what I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> Dave, Dave has it there. Let's look at our cameras and one, two, three, go. Oh, all right, cool? fantastic. The things we do for social media. Uh, thanks for coming on again, John. It's great meeting you in person. And I cannot wait for the day that we will find uh, ourselves in a European or or a city, some great city throughout the world. Uh, and we can maybe even shake hands, have a beer. Uh, I, I really look forward to that. Cause uh, you're imagine that man. Thanks for having me on guys. This was really fun. You're one of the real ones. Okay. Great to meet you, John. Yeah. See you buddy. Thanks very right. much everyone today. We had a great talk focusing on attribution influencer launches uh, and a lot of other great things. If you have any questions when we launch this post, uh, ask them on the post and, uh, John will, will, uh, be happy. I'm sure to, uh, to answer them. And yeah, thanks again, guys. We'll see you soon.